6 Easy Steps to Developing High Quality and Accessible Video Lectures A presentation given by Megan Patrick and Heidi Chen Instructional Designers at Michigan State University. Okay, so next are images. We like to use high quality images because the conversion process will reduce image quality, so it's, it's important to begin with higher quality graphics, especially for those charts and graphs with numbers and text. And also, all the images in the PowerPoint or the lecture has to be copyright free. Here's a, a, just a reminder for that. And here we listed some websites that offer copyright free images for our instructors. While the slides are being developed, we ask for a test recording. We find this step very useful. There have been some cases where we caught some issues with the recording settings, so we were able to work with the instructor to adjust that and then to correct the issue. So because of this proactive step, we do not have major audio problems when we receive their recording later on. So we've addressed uh, quite a few accessibility issues. Um, here in step three, we want to talk one more thing, which is a really important thing about making the site accessible, uh, which is adding alternative text. So our tech team is doing the heavy lifting to make all the PowerPoint slides accessible, but we need help from our subject matter experts to provide the descriptions of all the images they use in their uh, slides. That includes all the tables, images, charts, and graphs. So we asked them to provide that. We see some of our savvy uh, instructors adding all text themselves, but the majority of them would just send us the description and we add them in. Here are some examples of how to write alt text depending on the types of images. Some of the pretty photos are just decorative, but other formative, which can uh, enhance learning, and others are really important data graphs that probably need more detailed description. So step four is staff review. Um, the draft are sent to us and we review for teaching practice and accessibility, two things. So here's a list of things that we're looking for when we review. We'll identify some missing issues that may be during the step one and two. And we create handouts if need to. And at this point, audio samples need to be reviewed. And uh, we also work with the instructor on um, chunking down information if needed. Also, we look closely at the slides for accessibility issues and remediate, remediate them. We add all text, and sometimes we add in high quality graphics to enhance the lecture. And it, sometimes it takes quite a few back and forth uh, before we can finalize the slides. After we finalize the slides, we send them back to the instructor for audio recording. Since we have a tutorial that our tech team developed that include all the how-tos on audio recording and how to start and end a slide and what to do if they make mistakes, and also a reminder uh, that please listen after you record so you can catch some issues and correct them before you turn in your material. And also a, a specific reminder of avoid uh, using time sensitive languages so the lecture can be reused easily in the future. So here are the tutorials. Let's, let's watch it. It's pretty short. Hello instructors. Recording your lecture is an important part of creating a course module, and we'd like to provide some simple techniques to assist you. My name is Ben Curtis, and I am the media technician for the online food safety program. I'm here to help you with all of your audio related issues and concerns. The learning objectives for this session are to show an example of what a lecture might look like when it's ready for audio recording, as well as highlighting an effective process for recording audio into PowerPoint. The final objective is to provide some simple techniques that will allow the process to flow easily for all parties. We have found that the most effective way to record lecture narration into PowerPoint is by recording each slide individually. This allows for focus on each individual slide and it lets you take some time to pause in between recording of slides if needed. 
Start by selecting the Insert tab of the ribbon in PowerPoint. From there, select Audio, and then select Record Audio. An additional window will appear. Please note that providing a name for the audio recording is up to you and entirely optional. Select the red circle button when you are ready to begin recording. Once the recording has started, you may find it easier to drag the small window to the side so that you can see the content of your slide as you record. When you have finished the current slide, drag the small window back into view and select the black square button to stop the recording. Select Insert and you will notice that a new little speaker icon has been added to your slide. This is your newly recorded audio. I will now move on to additional slides and repeat the recording process for each slide while also providing additional techniques that have been found to assist with keeping the recording process efficient. Begin recording. If possible, try to record all of your slides at one time. This keeps the audio for each slide sounding the same as the one before or after it. Start each slide by saying, begin recording. You may have noticed this at the beginning of this slide. The purpose of this is to ensure that your microphone adjusts to the level of your voice for each recording. It also helps as we put together your presentation for viewing within the course. We also ask that you end each slide by saying, end recording, at the end of your recording. This process ensures that you have completed your thought and that you have not ended the recording without finishing. As an example, I will leave the beginning and ending statements for the following slide so that you can hear how it sounds in action. End recording. Begin recording. You may find that you feel as though you have misspoken or even just had to take a break because of a sneeze or a cough. Not to worry. Just go ahead and acknowledge the issue by saying so out loud. Make a pause and then start that sentence or thought over again. Anything that you said that was either incorrect, misspoken, or unintentional will be removed during editing. If you decided that you would like to re-record the audio for this slide, simply select the speaker icon, delete that, which will delete your recording, and then feel free to start over by re-recording audio for that slide. After recording, it is often helpful to review your own recordings. Doing so allows you to self-check, which sometimes highlights a misspoken statement or mispronunciation that you didn't catch while recording. End recording. Begin recording. You may find that you feel as though you have misspoken or even just had to take a break Thank you for your time. Hopefully the information shared will help you as you develop your course. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email and I will gladly help you with any issues you may have. Thank you. Okay, so that was Ben Perkins, uh, the voice talent and media guru of our program. So you, as you can see, the tutorial is short and sweet, and so we really hope our instructors can follow that and do the, all the correct things when they record their audio. We also highly recommend using headset to record audio. And here are two links to two very affordable and decent headsets. The last step is post-production. And here the lecture is being converted into video and posted into the course. Um, our instructor don't have to worry about this step, but we would really like them to have some ideas of what we do to their lectures. And so they can understand why it takes a while after they turn in the material and before the lecture show up in the course. After their lectures is being produced, captioned, and posted in the course, and this wraps up the whole lecture development process. Okay, back to Megan. So I'm sure some of you are asking, does this actually work? And our experience would say, yes, it does. We have seen quite an improvement in the quality of lectures that we receive from faculty. We also sent out a 
a small survey to our faculty to see to get some feedback on their experience with the guide and it was very positive and the guide is also being used by other programs on Michigan State's campus and other universities from when we presented this at OLC last year and it has done a really good job of helping to foster collaboration between instructional designers and our faculty having this guide in place the way it's set up and with the visuals is it really lays out clear expectations of what we're looking for from our faculty and we've had a lot of positive experiences from this guide um, some feedback we received before is I don't have an ed tech team how am I going to make this work and because this is really just chunking down the lecture development process it can still work with, without an ed tech team you can still do the pre-lecture development by yourself you can still follow the guidelines within step two implement accessibility, review your content, and even follow the recording techniques that we watched previously from Ben. Post-production really wouldn't be on your own, but you still need to export your video into a piece that can go into the LM. We have some keys to our success. We were very fortunate enough that we had a lot of support from the online food safety program team, particularly support from our leadership with this guide. It is sent to instructors as they are hired and when they update material. And because, as Heidi mentioned before, our think team consists of not only our education technology team, but we included other members of our own staff. So we had at least staff buy-in on this document. And part of that, too, is collaboration and our willingness to be open to feedback from them. And there was quite a few things after we sent them the first draft that we decided to go back and rework or change. To, so that made more sense to them, even though it made sense in our heads. Mm -hmm. And lastly, our choice of technology, being able to use Google Slides, Michigan State also partners with Google. So if you have an msu.edu email, you have access to a Google account. And so when we make an update, we don't have to send them a new link. It can still be the same link if they have this saved, they don't have to resave it again. And because it's not a PowerPoint slide, not on 365, we don't have this version control issue. And so that's been really nice. When we have an update, we don't have to worry about sending them a new copy. We just have to communicate the update. That is not to say that we have not had our fair share of challenges. As many of you know, changing the current culture is hard, particularly around online education and the demands of online education. And so we have had some faculty who started using the LDG right away and had success with it. And we have had some instructors who just have been with our program for a long time and don't see the need or desire to change what they've been doing for the last couple of years. And so it, it takes time to, to change the culture around teaching. And lastly, time. As many of you know who work in the online environment is sometimes you don't have enough time to follow the step that you'd like and you have to jump into the process and just do the best you can to make sure the course goes live when it starts for the students. And so that's been a challenge we constantly face as well. When we created the LDG, we had hoped that it would solve all the world's problems and we would live in a very great world. However, we've realized that it has not fixed all of our problems. It has helped with some, but more importantly, we've realized that we need to have more standards of practice around faculty onboarding and course development. And the LDG will be a part of those other systems, so it has helped to bridge the gap that we've seen identifying those things. How could the LDG be successful for you? What challenges might you face when implementing a guide like this? And what is the most important takeaway from this session? Okay, um, Heidi and I are just going to take a couple seconds to answer some of the questions that were in the chat. Um, there was one particular about, um, Um, one was, are we using any incentives to faculty who have been with us a long time? That is currently being talked about. We don't have an answer for that yet, but it has been discussed. There was a question about time. I'm trying to find it. The 15, no longer than 15 minutes because of the file size. I believe that actually is probably driven by probably the content more than anything for us, just because we work with a lot of science people and our faculty tend to want to dump everything into one lecture and so it really falls on us to try and help break them down we try to keep it around 20 minutes just because we are a master's level program and we do expect our students to be able to sit there for 20 minutes and watch a lecture i don't think we have file size issue because media space which is 
powered by Keturah, uh, does the compression for us. So we usually don't have any streaming. Luckily for us, we don't have a file size issue. Okay. Um, I do believe we were supposed to set some, si some time aside for more questions. So I believe at this point, um, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to either type them in the chat or um, I think you guys actually have the ability to talk. So if you'd like to talk, feel free. Oh, other pro online programs at Michigan State use this benefit? Yes. As we mentioned earlier that one of the keys to our success is that other programs have used this. This was shared with our, our online Master of Public Health program, and it was also discussed at our faculty learning community, mm -hmm. which consists of most of the online learning programs on campus. And just curious about how do you go about sharing this process with faculty? Um, partly, uh, Actually, word of mouth. So Michigan State has a what it's called the hub, um, and they deal with a lot of online learning on campus. And a lot of them come to the FLC on accessibility, which is where Heidi presented this as well. And so it's really been word of mouth, just people realizing that we have this tool and coming to us and asking if they can see it. And later on in spring, we are actually going to present this at MSU's learning conference. So we hope to share more with them. It looks like one question, is the PowerPoint available to us? We're yes, happy to <laughs> we're happy to share. <laughs> oh, yeah, it looks like we've, we've yeah. wrapped up. So we do want to thank all of you for attending. It's been great seeing all of everyone, the diverse audience that we have, and we hope that you found this presentation helpful.